Uh, no proactive medicines have been administered to these animals for a very long time. We need, we need veterinary care. That is, that is the biggest issue because a lot of these health assessments can't be done without a professional being able to come in and do proper testing. Definitely food and medicine. Uh, those are the two biggest things. We're also paying for water to be delivered because there is no water, uh, running water on site. So Tanya, welcome to the show today. Um, let's just kind of briefly talk about Rescue the Rescue. Okay. I think a lot of people know that there was a rescue set up that got moved from the west side of the island at one point to the east side of the island, and it's run into problems, and you and several other volunteers are trying to save it. So explain how they got into the volunteers' hands saving this rescue. It was brought to my attention uh, mid-July when I was assisting an international vet program uh, that was going to be working on site at uh, Roatan Rescue to help kind of assess and help treat, provide internship for veterinary students. And Janessa had set that up, I, I think, a year prior. Janessa was the original creator of this Roatan Rescue. Correct. Um, I personally had not seen the site in over a year, but when I went to assist that veterinary program, um, we realized very quickly that Janessa had been on site or off site, uh, off island um, for a couple months at that point, and there really was no management structure in place. Um, food was about ready to run out. Um, there was no funding coming in to the shelter itself. And so myself, as well as Global Health, which was the umbrella of this veterinary program, started a GoFundMe um, so that we could start to raise money to be able to get some donation dollars back into uh, the care of these animals. So we started fundraising at that point. When I realized the, the true need and how, how big it was, um, a lot of other volunteers also jumped in. Uh, ones that had seen it for themselves that were also helping with this veterinary program and decided to try to save as many as we could. First question, and I know a lot of people have asked this, but is Janessa still involved? Janessa is not involved. No. Um, she, she basically washed her hands of this rescue situation. People are going to ask what happened to the money that she raised? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't have access to her books. I don't have access to all of her uh, financials. We recently, very recently, were given permission um, to be able to try to access those funds. Um, it goes through a series of accounts that none of us are signers on. So we're still at liberty to her and the people that are on those accounts to be able to release those donation funds. There's been a little bit that has come in, but her donor dollars have dropped significantly, as you can imagine. Right. And, uh, and that could change at any point. What inspired the volunteer group to take over? Because this, if, from what I understand, it was a disaster. Uh, at one point, I know that there was a, a Honduran group that wanted to take it. I know that the city of Santos Guardiola wanted to shut it down. A lot of animals there that have been completely dependent now on humans taking care of them. What made these volunteers do this? It seems like almost an insane project. So let me clarify. Our, our original intention was not to actually take this on long term. Um, we saw the initial need <clears throat> and jumped into action to try to raise money to to help provide care for these animals, not understanding uh, what would this evolve into. Um, there was an organization, FAPA, uh, which was put into place uh, to be able to enforce the animal welfare laws of Honduras. Um, they did uh, show up on site. Uh, they have been in communication with us. However, they see the gravity of the situation and are not in a position to take this on. Um, the municipals, both of Roatan and of Santos Guardiola, have also been out to visit. 
they are basically wanting guarantees that it is going to be shut down and dissolved. It was never legitimately supposed to be there anyway. No permits were ever authorized. No NGO was actually properly formed in order to function in Santa Scordiola. Um, so it's it's basically at a a time frame that's very very limited for us to be able to find care and resources for these animals. What were the conditions when you stepped in and took a look at the health of some of these animals and just the general um, uh, organization, I guess? A uh, couple different factors on that. Um, one is obviously the health of the animals. Um, in dealing with the vet program that was on site in mid-July, being able to get true medical evaluations of some of these animals uh, was very disheartening. Um, we were seeing uh, communicable diseases, lack of quarantine areas for those communicable diseases, um, emaciation, uh, stage three and four heartworm, um, ehrlichia in massive numbers. Uh, no proactive medicines have been administered to these animals for a very long time, so the disease is very rampant. The overcrowding numbers has also created pack mentalities. Um, where there's no room really to try to rehabilitate that behavior, um, being able to remove those animals in order to do one-on-one -on -one behavior assessments isn't really practical. Right. Um, there's also huge sanitation issues. Um, they were actually cleaning clinics up in the medical center, which is on the second story, and throwing that water off the roof into the kennels below. Um, there is no running water. There is no sanitation protocols in place. We're working very hard to put those into place, but there's a lot of bad habits and, and behavior that has been uh, done over the course of years with some of these employees. So these habits are really hard to break. Um, you have contaminated soil. They're not cemented structures. So when there's disease um, from different fluids and things that actually gets into the soil, so not being able to move the animals out of that containment, they're going to continue to get reinfected by the ground beneath them. So we're up against many, many challenges. How are you addressing these health issues? Uh, have you brought in vets to help you evaluate and, and what is their opinion? It's overwhelming. Um, it's overwhelming for the vet program that was there in mid-July to the point where they said they couldn't bring students back into that environment because it is basically a battleground triage situation. It's not a learning environment. We have had a volunteer uh, who lives here on the island that used to be a vet tech back in the States who has volunteered her time. Uh, we've flown in one of the women that she used to work with from the states to help her and help assist her because it's too much for one person. Um, we also are in contact with uh, a couple other vet techs that we may be flying in. We need we need veterinary care. That is that is the biggest issue because a lot of these health assessments can't be done without a professional being able to come in and do proper testing and assessments. We're hoping to possibly get some students coming in from the mainland from the veterinary college over there. We're in touch with Humane Society International, asking for their help, as well as ASPCA International. We're, we're reaching out as much as we can to try to get help. I know that the animals um, are kind of being evaluated for adoption. Mm -hmm. Some of them, it'll be easy. They're just the kind of animal that are, they, they have the personality, mm -hmm. despite the pack, and, and those animals are salvageable. Yes. How can people adopt those animals? So the preference actually would be a visit on site. Um, we really want to make sure that whoever is coming in understands the personality and the needs of the animal, whether that be uh, behavior, um, whether it's a good fit uh, medically. Uh, if we haven't gotten around to testing that particular animal, we really want to make sure that we are testing and sending any medicines home that the animal might need. We really want to see successful adoptions and lifelong pairings. So we're trying to send home any meds, proactive care, and educating along the way. Uh, local communities really, really do want animals in their homes. 
And so part of the process is also educating about how to keep those animals healthy. I know that one thing that happened out of the kindness of her heart, I know Janessa was trying to take care of as many animals as possible. But at some point it was, you, you, you can only expand so large before it's not healthy. And that's what has become in the situation. Yeah. Some of those dogs may be people's dogs that were lost that they don't know where to find them. Honestly, uh, we've had quite a few people send us pictures of animals that they have lost over the course of the last two years. Uh, we try our best. We have many animals to sort through, uh, trying to find different characteristics that match up. We have had some successes. We've actually had uh, three now that have been rehomed back with their owners. That's great. Um, we're very excited about that. Uh, we do have people that show up at the gate wanting to look around to see if they can find their animal. It is something that uh, I think was more common uh, than people know. Right. Um, there were a lot of animals that were picked up, maybe looking in distress, that were actually owned and loved. And so we definitely welcome anyone who believes that they might have an animal at the shelter to come by. Recently, and this is August the 29th, there was a spay and neuter clinic mm -hmm. that took place. Um, that was something that you were involved in. It wasn't originally part of what your organization was trying to do, No. but I understand it had already been set up and was already in motion. Um, how did that go and what is going to happen going forward? So the spay and neuter clinic was a huge surprise to us. Uh, it was brought to our attention by uh, the head vet of, of the spay and neuter clinic that he had set up uh, this with Janessa almost a year ago. Um, they had already purchased their plane tickets and were very, very concerned about what the outcome was going to be now that Janessa was no longer a part of the organization um, and had walked away. So we, from that point, decided to try to organize it because the benefit of what they had to offer to the island as a whole and to the community uh, was something that we didn't want to dismiss. Um, there's the possibility of them coming back annually. Again, a benefit to the island that, you know, you just, you want to take advantage of those opportunities. I understand it was a pretty nice success. I understand there were a lot of local families. Um, previously, they've been a bit hesitant to have their animals spayed or neutered because it's just, I, I mean, when I talk to to some men, they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that to my dog. And I'm like, yeah. why? And they're like, well, he's he's no longer a, a, a dog if you do that. And it's like, they don't quite get it. But they are beginning to understand that if they don't get them spayed and neutered, there's just more dogs. Correct. And then that's a big problem here. Um, though generally the dogs are kind of friendly. I've seen most of them, even the ones that are like loose. But uh, there is the danger in many situations of, a, like you say, a pack mentality, depending on the breeds, and that's not a good thing. Right. Um, I, I think the misconception in the community comes from, you know, the lack of trust. Um, they, they don't understand uh, the benefit to spay and neuter clinics necessarily. I have heard rumors, just like you have, about uh, possibly having your dog turn gay or that it won't protect the, the the household and the family and the house any longer if it's neutered. Um, those are things, again, that are gonna come with time and education um, and understanding that by doing these procedures, their animal will come home to them and, and are still gonna be a part of their family and will be just the same as they were before. So again, that is another really great way to, to benefit the community. What do you need most to help see this to its end? Uh, definitely food and medicine. Uh, those are the two biggest things. We're also paying for water to be delivered because there is no water, uh, running water on site. We have $60 every three days in water truck delivery. Um, so we're trying to brainstorm how to do that without having to invest more into a property that we're no longer going to have in a few months. Right. We need veterinary care. Huge. We need people out there to make assessments. Um, we need behavioralists as well, um, people to come out and kind of help us understand how to improve behavior out there in, in groupings or, or um, changing their environment in certain ways in order to help them start the process of not feeling so stressed and anxious. How can locals 
and people from the expat community help you? We're getting so much help and, and so grateful for it. Uh, in fact, with the Spay and Neuter Clinic, it really opened up to a much larger network of people than I ever expected. We have many people who are uh, asking to volunteer directly on their trips coming up, um, wanting to know how they can help. Uh, we need dog walkers. We need people to come out that are willing to walk dogs down to the beach so that they get exercise, so they're not cooped up as much, so we can better assess behavior. Um, we need people to come out and possibly help uh, catalog animals. Every time we go out to catalog animals, something happens, some, some situation, we find dogs underneath platforms that we haven't seen before that have been hiding under there because of uh, heat, uh, violent behavior in the, in the pack, um, food aggression. Uh, as those pop up, we have to deal with those right away before they go back under. Um, so admin, social media, uh, networking, fundraising, I mean, all the things, honestly, we're, we're very overextended right now. The goal um, in the end mm -hmm. is to uh, help these animals as many as you can, mm -hmm. and then reduce the size of this facility's operation until it's absorbed and gone. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. The, the actual goal is to dissolve it completely. That might also be part of integrating a, uh, a food program out in the community where we have animals that we can start to put back into those communities, uh, teach them how to show us when there's symptoms or signs in those animals uh, that need care or help, uh, where we can assist with food programs, proactive medicines, even out in the community, which is where they belong. They don't belong in a facility like this. It's not sustainable. It's not uh, conducive with the Honduran street dog mentality. Um, we want to get these dogs back out into the communities. One final thing is if, if, if you're watching folks, um, there is a food drive that my radio station yes. is doing on the 9th of September yes. at both Eldon's locations. Yes. I want to thank Eldon and his staff for helping yes, work this out. Thank you so much. We're going to set up tables in the front and uh, we don't want you sending donation money because we just would rather you come buy the food and we'll make sure it gets distributed. Um, uh, Sherry Visker's organization, which is Roar, mm -hmm. I know you've been working with her, um, and that's a good thing. And, and what I'd personally like to see is that we're able to create some kind of program with Eldens where we can do this on a full-time basis, where people can go in and just as a quick donation, buy a can, a few cans, or a small bag, or a big bag, and make a donation so that it helps all of these islanders that would be and fantastic. all of these dogs. Because that's the only way it's really, it's got to be something that's constantly in the, the forefront. Mm -hmm. But if you're here and you're around a September 9th and you're not playing in the golf tournament at Pristine Bay, oh. <laughs> please come by. We'll be there with both locations. You've got volunteers and uh, um, it'll be from eight until five in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And we'd love to have you. If people want to donate money, mm -hmm. how can they donate cash? I'm sure there's like a way to transfer it to you, or is there a place they give you money, or how is that done? So there's a couple different ways. Um, we have had the uh, opportunity to partner with Roatan Animal Support, which is another animal organization here on the island. They've been established since 2019. Um, because we are not an organization ourselves, um, and we don't have a 501c3 that can actually collect donation dollars, um, they've been kind enough to utilize their platform to uh, give us direct access to the donor dollars that they're collecting through their website. Um, that is at roatananimalsupport.org. Um, you can actually do the drop down menu of rescue the rescue so you can actually target our effort. Um, so appreciated. Uh, for cash, uh, we do have a box at the airport <clears throat> um, that used to be uh, Roatan Rescue. Um, and we are in the works right now of trying to get signage on that, but there is a, a cash drop box. So you can actually just drop cash right in there if you prefer to do it that way. You can also reach out to us directly and we can do pickup. We can 
We can tell you where to go to deliver it. And um, how do you do that directly? So uh, messaging us through the Facebook page, um, the Rescue the Rescue Animal Shelter. Um, a lot of following on there, a lot of updates. It's a really, really great resource uh, to be able to kind of see the steps that we're taking. So Rescue the Rescue on Facebook. Rescue the Rescue Animal Shelter okay. on Facebook. Um, you'll see our adoption updates, um, needs, uh, Amazon wish list, uh, links to the Roatan Animal Support website. Um, it's a really, really great resource. It's funny, Facebook was never something that I was a huge fan of before moving to this island, but it is definitely the resource that's utilized here. So that's our that's our best bet there. Absolutely. Tanya, thanks for everything you're doing. Thanks, thanks to all the people. Me. I know you represent a bunch of people, and I know you're not the it's only a one. Huge effort. But I do want to I want to spread the word. Thank you very much. Um, I have two animals that I have adopted, and and I'm very blessed, you know, and they're both fixed, and uh, you know, and and I'm still learning, you know. Uh, Erlichia is common. Very. Even if you're giving them the meds, they mm -hmm. can still get it. Yes. This is something I didn't know. Heartworm, even though I'm giving them the heartworm, like heart guard, they can still get it. So, watch what your dogs are doing. Make sure they get vet checkups on a regular basis. Yes. Don't go online and Google what to do if my dog is doing something. Take it to a doctor who knows what they're doing. Anyway, thank you very much for being on. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it.